Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome 2022 Bradley Prize winner, Glenn C. Lowry. Thank you. A specter haunts the domestic political landscape in America today. It is the specter of racial conflict. The pundits tell us that we live in a period of racial reckoning in America. The anger and alienation amongst many black Americans is palpable. Racial dispute suffuses our public life from school committee elections to national political contest. This estrangement of journalists, politicians, intellectuals, and activists derives from the fact of persisting black disadvantage across so many fronts in our country's economic and social life. The reality here is too familiar too widely known to require elaborate recitation, whether we talk about health or wealth, education or income, imprisonment or criminal victimization, the relatively disadvantaged status of those Americans who descend from slaves here in the third decade of the 21st century, more than 150 years after the Emancipation Proclamation is clear for all to see. What are we to make of this? That question has bedeviled me for decades. Indeed, ever since I began graduate studies in economics at MIT a half century ago. So it is with a heavy heart that I stand before you this evening, a black American economist in this era of racial discontent in my country, an Ivy League professor and a descendant of slaves. A beneficiary of the civil rights revolution now over two generations in the past, which has made possible for me a life that my ancestors could only have dreamed of. More than that, I am a patriot who loves his country. I'm a man of the West and inheritor of its great traditions. As such, I feel compelled to represent the interest of my people here and now. However, that reference is not unambiguous. It has both communal and civic antecedents. But the civic obligations are prior to the communal ones. Racial disparities are real, of course, but just how important is race as such? Inequality in America is not mainly a racial issue. The many poor and marginalized white people deserve our concern, too. Interracial marriage has grown dramatically, as has the number of people who view themselves as multiracial, including the first black president and vice president of this country. Is race a fundamental difference between people, or is it a social construct? We talk incessantly about race and identity, but what about culture? What about values? Are these not aspects of our humanity that transcend race? The alienation afflicting so many prosperous black Americans is the result, I believe, of the false narratives that folks are being told by demagogues in ideologues, narratives about something called white supremacy and how it threatens them, about how we have, in effect, reverted to the era of Jim Crow. My work has sought to rebut these departures from reality, in part by looking at what has actually happened over the last 75 years. A black middle class has emerged. There are black billionaires. Our influence on American culture is stunning and has worldwide resonance. In fact, when viewed in global comparative perspective, we black Americans are rich and powerful. 
We have, for instance, access to 10 times the per capita income of the typical Nigerian. The cultural barons and elites of America, the people who run the mainstream media, who give out literary prizes and foundation grants, who run the human resource departments of corporate America, the universities, the movie studios. These powerful, powerful people have bought into the woke, anti-racism sensibility, hook, line, and sinker. All of which disproves the premise that the American dream does not apply to us black people. To say so is to tell a lie to our children about their country a crippling lie which, when taken as gospel, robs our people of agency and a sense of control over our fate, and a patronizing lie that portrays profound doubt about the ability, our ability, to face up to the responsibilities and to bear the burdens of our freedom. For that is the existential challenge we black Americans now face in the 21st century not to throw off the shackles of our oppression, but rather to take up the awesome burdens of freedom. The Civil War left 600,000 dead in a country of 30 million. The consequence of that war, together with the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments enacted just afterwards, was to make the enslaved Africans and their descendants into citizens. In the fullness of time, we have become equal citizens. Now that should not have taken another hundred years, nor should my ancestors have been enslaved in the first place. But here's the thing. Slavery was a commonplace human practice dating back to antiquity. Emancipation, freeing four million enslaved persons as the result of a mass movement for abolition, that was a new idea a Western idea, an American idea. It was the fruit of Enlightenment philosophy and Christian charity. It was an idea brought to fruition over a century and a half ago in our own United States of America with the liberation of an enslaved people. Such an achievement would not have been possible without philosophical insights and moral commitments cultivated in the 17th and 18th centuries in the West. Ideas about the essential dignity and the God-given rights of all human persons. That is, America's founding at the end of the 18th century brought something new into the world. Slavery was a holocaust out of which emerged an accomplishment that advanced the morality and the dignity of humankind, namely, emancipation. The ultimate incorporation of African descended people fully into the American body politic has been a monumental, unprecedented achievement for human freedom. To whom much has been given, of him much shall be required. For this saga is not over. Freedom is one thing. Equality, quite another. The former is a necessary but not sufficient condition for the latter. As such, it is both futile and dangerous for us black Americans to rely on others to shoulder our communal responsibilities. If we want to walk with dignity, to enjoy truly equal standing within this diverse, prosperous, and dynamic society, within this free society, then we must accept the fact that white America can never give us what we seek in response to our protests and remonstrations. Rather, we must earn equal status by dint of our own efforts. Now, I take no pleasure in doing so, but I feel obliged to report this reality. Equality of dignity, equality of standing, of honor, of security in one's position within society, of an equal ability to command the respect of others, such things cannot be handed over. They will not be the fruit of insurrection, 
violent uprising, or rebellion. Equality of this sort is something which we black Americans must wrest with our bare hands from a cruel and indifferent world by means of our own effort. Inspired by the example of our enslaved and newly freed ancestors, we must make ourselves equal. No one can do it for us. My fear is that, is that until we recognize and accept this unlovely but inexorable fact about the human condition, until we assure the victimhood rhetoric and embrace the existential realities about race in our country, until then, the disparities that have so troubled our politics and that so threaten our domestic tranquility will continue to persist. Thank you.